verse 13, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 1 John 4, 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify, beloved, the guy writing this was a disciple of Jesus. So this isn't a fairy tale. This is a guy who had a first-hand account of what he's writing. So when he says, we have seen, actually he says it in chapter one, he says, the one that was in the beginning, the word of life, he goes, we, we saw him. What was it like for a disciple to, be, to behold the, the Christ, the Messiah? He says, we held him, we touched him, we handled him, we heard him. It's the same guy. This is how we know. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges, if anyone, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Somebody say, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Wait, pause. Oh, my Lord. Lord, break unbelief today regarding this. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. Amen. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Lord help, as Pastor Mike would say. Amen. You may be seated. God is good. You know, what I want to talk about today out of this scripture is the idea that loving God begins with God. Loving God begins with God. He says, we love God because he first loved us. And so I want to unpack that. And, but I want to start with a story. I have a grandson. His name is Asher. And thanks to Pastor Mike, I am getting charged for using his name. Um, because of inflation, uh, Pastor Mike is off easy on $5 every time the name is mentioned. But my grandson is, have, has an agent now, my daughter, and uh, it's up to 50 so, times are tough. But one day, my, my, my grandson's going to be four years old in March. So in 2022, he's about two, two and a half. And I was watching him at his, at his parents' house, and we went for a walk outside. And, um, you know, as little kids, they want to run everywhere. So I'm walking with him, and we're just talking and chatting. I'm just watching. I'm just enjoying being a grandfather. And so I just asked him. I said, hey, Asher, what do you see? He goes, oh, I see a stick. I see a bug. I see the grass. I see the sidewalk. And he starts, and he was just looking down. I said, hey, look up. Tell me what else you see. The sky. I see the sky. I see the trees. And then I was like, Asher, who made that? He goes, um... And he paused, God, I said, what, what did he just say? I said, who made that? He's like, God, what else did he make? The sticks, what else did he make? The bugs, the grass, I said, what else did he make? The trees, what else did he make, Asher? And he paused again, he's walking, he goes, me. And I was struck by that, and I knew I was in a moment. And I'm like, man, Greenhouse Kids is doing a great job. Yeah. We bless God for the Greenhouse Kids ministry. 
We thank God for, for parents that walk and live in the fear of the Lord. And yet I knew I was in this moment, and so I do what any good grandfather does. I made up a song. <laughs> so if there's kids in the room, I wanna, I wanna invite the kids to stand up. Maybe the parents can help, because you're gonna help me with the big idea here of the sermon. So I wanna invite the kids and Andrew to just stand where you're at if you're in the room. <laughs> Andrew's like the big kid on staff. So I'm not gonna have him do a dance. But I, I created this song. <laughs> And I just went, God made the trees, and God made me. He's like, I like that song, Baba. He calls me Baba. Because I like that song. I said, I love God because he first loved me. So let's kind of let's do that. God made the trees, and God made me. I love God because he first loved me. God made the trees, and God made me. I love God because he first loved me. Man, I wish I had a drunk, because I'd be like, God made the trees and God made me. I love God because he first loved me. Beloved, may we never forget this truth. I was struck that how is it that a, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> what a great job, leading by example. You know what I love about Andrew is childlike faith. But that's what's required in this. I realized when I'm looking at my grandson and we're making this declaration, and he was like, what a great song, Bob. I was like, you have no idea what you're declaring right now. And I was like, Lord, how is it that a two and a half year old child who hasn't come to the altar and made a profession of faith, hasn't gone to the, all the, the theology classes and hasn't done this yet has the revelation, he's created by God. Made by God, looking at the trees, and the Bible has a lot to say about trees. Even if you look at this tree here, a replica, a little tree, looks a little ominous and dark maybe, but trees can tell you a lot about the season it's in. I want to ask you, what season are you in? We can look, this tree can be deceiving because we don't know if it's dead or if it's alive yet. We don't know if it's about to be cut down and thrown into a fire, or whether it's about to bloom and be fruitful. Even as we come through this Christmas season, I want us to think about the idea that we love God because he first loved us. And even if you're struggling and maybe you don't even know God, that God promises a restoration that he would restore and plant people to be like, Oaks of righteousness, trees of righteousness. People have been restored and redeemed. So coming out of this Christmas season, we've heard, we've asked the question, what child is this? What child is this? We heard, we learned, we sung. It was taught that the prophets of old, like Isaiah, declared that he would be called wonderful, counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We also heard that he would be pierced for our transgressions and our sin, and that he would pour his soul out unto death. When we consider what child is this, we can conclude with confidence that God's love never fails, that God's love never gives up. When you think of what can restrain God's love? Not even our fallen nature could restrain God's love and the fact that God became a man and dwelt among us. Here's the problem. Why does this matter? Because the digital age has taught us that presence doesn't matter anymore. Yet God became a man and brought presence to an absent world. God came near at a point where God's eyes are looking across the landscape of the earth, looking at humanity, looking for friends, looking for ones who are righteous, finding none, he then becomes that which he was looking for. What a stunning thought. Christ being born means that God has been embodied in a person. That love is a person. When it says that God is love, is not this thing. Love is a noun, beloved. Love is a noun. What does it say about him? 
Because most of, if we're honest, most of the time, our ideas about God are like, he's near, but he's far. He's near, but he's far. Kind of like the, the jugular vein. Have you kind of, you ever done like the whole finger on the pulse thing and you can feel this, this pulse, right? And, and, and yet, some of our walk with God is like that. When was the last time you had a conversation with your jugular vein? With your pulse? You know, you, you know that thing's not, you're probably not alive right now. You know it's crucial to life. Life is running through the vein. And yet, it's near, but it's far. But yet in a world that was fallen, full of pain, full of sin, God came down. In a world that was in need of empathy and hope, God came down. In a world that needed a savior and a redeemer, God came down. Why? Because he is love. God is love. Love is a person. It kind of takes on new meaning when we understand that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So if God sends the son, the implications are that he's a father. Beloved, if he's a father, then that means the only logical conclusion we can come to that in his very nature, he is loving. God is love. God is love, meaning that love starts and ends with God. God is the reference point. Jesus declared it. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He's not an angry taskmaster, although when we love God, there are boundaries as we obey his commands. God is not a philosophy or an ethic, though we can be philosophical and, and reason why this is important. He is not an, an ethic in the sense, but we also know, as we heard even uh, Pastor Andrea declare a few weeks ago that there, he has ethics, Jesus has some standards. And because he's the reference point, he gets to kind of declare and, and decide what is what. He loved us first by sending his only and most precious son to justify you and I, to justify the ungodly, the Bible says. But some of you may be asking, even in this room, am I too far from him? Is there room for me and the family? You see, my first point, in the birth of Christ, God came near so that we would not settle for dead and un uninspired religion. That's my first point. In the birth of Christ, God comes near. God is no longer far. He has come near so that we don't settle for dead and uninspired religion. Jesus came as a true good shepherd, not to destroy the sheep, but to redeem them. And I think there's valid questions to ask regarding what is God, like what is God? What is he like? Does he exist? Is God personal? And I just wanna to announce today with boldness that Christianity shouts, we know what God's like. We don't have to guess what God is like because the creator has now been revealed to us in the Son. Christianity shouts, we know what God is like. God is love. Behold the man, Christ Jesus. Which leads us to the aspect of the uniqueness of Christianity. This is what makes Christianity unique. This is what makes it distinct from, from every other religion that claims peace. Most religions offer peace through how good you are or how good I could perform or what I could possibly earn. And yet in Christ, we see that the peace of God is a person who desires relationship. We know what God is like. He is Christ the Lord. Christianity is unique in, in, in that it's a faith, not a blind faith, but it is a faith in which the truly divine and truly human Son of God came to die a cruel and, and humiliating death on the cross. The gospel is unique because the cross has become the centerpiece of how God has justified the ungodly 
See, the cross is intended to redeem, to justify, to heal, to restore, to bring renewal. And yet, like this tree, there was a cross, a tree set apart that our king would hang on and become the curse. Become the one who the good shepherd would would lay down his life for his sheep, hanging on a tree. This is important because the cross unites people. Beloved, if there's ever a time that we need to actually behold the cross and believe actually the implications of the cross, it's coming into this year. Because the enemy has an agenda, the accuser of the brethren seeks to divide, seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And beloved, unless we we rest in the shade of the cross and come into agreement with the implications that the cross has come to unite Jews and Gentiles alike, we're gonna, we're gonna miss it. God desires to bring unity to the body. We're powerless to redeem ourselves. We are powerless, and that's what the cross does. The cross invites us in. We have to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Beloved, our goodness is not gonna keep you from hell. The cross and the resurrection of Christ points to a humble king born to die. A humble king who would bring justice and righteousness through a great sacrifice, the shedding of innocent blood. So too, at the last judgment, God's gonna settle all the cases. Pastor Mike has preached on this this year. We've heard a lot about standing before the Lord. Beloved, the implications that every single person on the earth, no matter what you believe is true, what you believe is true in a subjective way still doesn't change the fact that we will all have to stand before God and answer, why did you not put your faith in my son? Our life will have to answer for that in every way. Even as believers, we'll have to answer for the moments that in the seasons where I declare, I just don't have time to seek God. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to come to prayer on Wednesdays. For whatever the reason is, and yet, as one man of God put it earlier, maybe a couple years ago, he says that, that our time on social media will be an indictment against us. As to the time and how we spent it. See, the crucifixion is birthed in the heart of God and releases all of creation from its groaning. That's why we pray to God. That's why even we start with God. Would you, would you break curses? God, would you bring healing? Would you restore? We can do that because of the cross of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood, which makes him truly the author of salvation, the finisher. He's, he's the end and the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the heir of all things. Even when you think of why God created Humanity, it says, Paul would say it in Colossians, all things were created by him, for him. You want to know why you were created? For him. You and I were created to be lovers of God. So even in the fall in the garden when Adam and Eve fell, it wasn't that they stopped being lovers. They just chose to love something else. And the cross beckons us to behold the man Jesus. We don't have to guess how he loves us. All you have to do is imagine this man hanging on a tree, bearing the penalty that we deserve to pay, dying a death that we deserved. But yet in 1 John 4.10, it says that this is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and set his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, the cross then becomes the invitation to real love. Oh God, what has he done? 
when we think of the cross, I got some little things here, not little, but what has love done? It's a replica. These are replicas of some things that Jesus had to endure. A flagrum. You ever heard the verses, by his stripes we are healed? You imagine 39 whips with this thing meant to rip flesh apart? Pierced for our transgressions. A humble king who came and put on a crown of thorns so that we can have a crown of life. He is so good. You know, one of, one of my Bible teachers once said that the heart is defenseless against two things. It's undeserved mercy and unreserved kindness. This is what God has done. In his kindness, in his mercy, he gets up on that tree and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. For the sake of love. Want to know what it means that God loved us first? You got to behold the man on the tree. See, we can't love God with all our hearts until we know he loves us with all of his heart. And God wants to empower us to love him. The Holy Spirit releases revelation of God's love. And I think even today that the Holy Spirit's moving and touching some of you even in this room, even as we prayed, I think that from this day forward, some of you will not fall back into some habitual sins anymore because you're gonna be pierced by love today. We don't have to walk in the patterns of the past because God makes all things new. Amen. We love him because he first loved us. Let me ask you, church, those watching online, what kind of love does God love with? Is it transactional? Can you trust it? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What was it like for his innocent flesh to be pierced by nails such as these? I love the implications of the cross, beloved. I really do. It, if you want to know what fuels me to give myself to prayer, and I wish I could do it better, what gives me fuel to believe that God wants to raise up a house of prayer in this city, that he has given a mandate to Greenhouse Church to say, will you give yourself to building a house of prayer for my presence where my glory dwells? You know what fuels me? The cross. Because nothing outside of that, nothing makes sense. It's because of this extravagant love that I say yes again and again and again and again. And then he invites us into it. He invites us into this relationship. He says, you know what? The one who's in me has no fear. The one who's in me has no fear. But let me ask, if you're wondering what God is like, just take a moment and just picture Jesus hanging on a cross. And even right now, I want to make a personal, this is how much I love you. Pierced for our sins, bruised for our iniquities. This is the vision for the next year. I pray that even beyond, I pray this would be the vision for the rest of your life. That you would be a saint who is wounded by God's love. Yeah. It's what drove the apostles, it what drove the saints of old to go to the depths that they would go to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They understood and they had a revelation that the one who was 
pierced for our transgressions was the one that actually pierced them with his love? Will we allow that kind of love to pierce us? Because the only way forward is that we actually begin to be the saints that live and walk in the first love reality. That nothing else matters. The implications are serious. We must consider that saying yes to Jesus is going to mean saying no to a thousand other things. See, the cross is where God's wrath and God's mercy meet. The Bible describes the cross in Isaiah 52, 14. If you're, if you're taking notes, you can read it on your own. This wasn't like this, this cute picture that they kind of present in movies. It says in Isaiah 52 that his, you couldn't even recognize him as a human being. What has love done? Like that song says, oh, the cross, what you've done. It was more than enough. It was more than enough. Early church historian Eusebius described scourging. I know there's kids in the room, but I, th I, think, I think our children need to understand the implications of the cross, of this man Jesus. 39 stripes, Eusebius would go on to say, around 300 AD, he described Roman scourging of Christians like this. At one time, they were torn by scourges down to deep-seated veins and arteries so that the hidden contents of the recesses of their bodies, their entrails and organs were exposed to sight. The crucifixion, Charles Spurgeon would say, the crucifixion of Christ was a crowning sin of the human race. So we have to understand that the forgiveness of sins and Jesus dying on the cross is an act of justice. I want to boldly declare, we are a church that stands in the gap for justice. And I think Pastor Mike and the team has been clear that justice without Jesus is going to fall short. But you know, as wonderful and humbling as the crucifixion narrative is, it's been described as the most historical event ever. The most historical, the most important historical event ever. There can be no resurrection of Christ narrative without the crucifixion of Christ. For those that are called to preach in this room, I think we all are called to preach. Those that are sharing the gospel, evangelists in the room, I am praying that today that the Lord would raise up preachers of the cross again. Lord, raise up preachers of the cross. I think we need to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit and honor him and love him and allow him to have his way in our life and preach the cross, preach the cross from Gainesville to the nations. The question remains, what is God after? What is he after? He's after the heart. Lord, I pray that even hearts that have been hard over some time would be softened even this morning. Holy Spirit, do what you love to do. Bring revelation, spirit of wisdom and revelation of God's love that we would know today without a doubt that God so loved the world, that God so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. You know, before we can understand even the cross as something done for us, we have to understand that it's something done by us. I think to preach a sermon that says God is love and that's why he went to the cross is an awesome sermon. I'm actually talking about that today. But we want to be sober and understand that love took him there but our sin took him there. Which brings the question of who killed Jesus? Who delivered up Jesus to die? One 19th century pastor wrote, 
the question of who killed Jesus, who delivered up Jesus to die. Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. On a human level, Judas gave him up to the priest who gave him up to Pilate, who gave him up to the soldiers who crucified him. But on a divine level, the Father gave him up, and he gave himself up to die for us. As we face the cross, he says, then we can say to ourselves both, I did it. My sins sent him there. And he did it. His love took him there. There's a scene in the Gospels that just... It's, it's beautiful and terrifying when I think of this point because it's easy to look at the narrative and say, boy, those Romans and those Jews and all those involved and Judas, man, I'm sure glad that wasn't me. But when I read the phrase where it says, when they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. When I begin to meditate on that, I have to see my own voice within the crowd. And until that happens, we're going to settle for dead religion. The crucifixion narrative is, it's, is a passion narrative. It's a story of divine love going after an unfaithful bride. God has set his affections on a harlot. So what am I calling us to? I have to have the worship team come up. Because I want us to respond to this. What I'm calling us to is a place of surrender. When we think about this making room series, make room, make room for God. I'm asking us to, to surrender and make room for God to move in your life. For you to surrender and make room for God to move in the workplace, in your families, in your schools, in our businesses. Surrender for Greenhouse Church, my friends, the body of Christ. I tell you the burden I've been carrying, and I'll just quote the words of Jesus in Revelation 2, and I ask you to reflect on his words. You have labored for my name. I have this against you. You have left your first love. Beloved, it's not enough to do church stuff if you're not doing it with him. Apes doesn't matter if you're not living in the reality of your first love with God. See, it's first love that washes away all the shame. It's first love, it's his love, me walking in that reality that allows me to to run to him when I blow it instead of running away from him. Can we set our hearts and come into agreement that for the rest of our lives as a church, either until we go to heaven or until we meet him face to face when he splits the sky, that he will find a church, he will find saints who are passionately in love with him. This was gonna be the fuel for our prayer momentum. This was gonna be the fuel to evangelism, our generosity, and, and the Lord has done. I thank God for the things that he's done, but you can actually labor in the name of Jesus and yet not do it with him. What would it look like and maybe, and this was the sense I was just getting even in prayer. Like we're doing the routine over and over and over. And the question's looming, there has to be more to God than this. There has to be more to you, God, than this. Would you awaken something in me? And, and I pray that you would be awakened. Just even reflect. I'm asking the faith family to reflect. Reflect. Can we come into agreement that we would commit to being a first love church? That this church would have children come out of kids and youth that are first love messengers of the gospel. I'm 
And for those that maybe haven't made a decision for Jesus, maybe you had questions about God, but you don't have to guess anymore. This is love. This is love. 1 John 3, 16, this is, this is how we know what love is. That Christ died for us. This is how we know. The Bible describes this promise of a new covenant. And the ancient idea of covenant means to cut. They would cut a covenant. They would, they would split an animal in two. And this animal would have to give up its life. And they would, they would go into covenant with one another. So now in Christ, his flesh has been cut to establish a new covenant forgiving us of our sins and promising eternal life. I pray that today, while it is called today, that you would make a decision to live for Jesus. That this, you would understand, is real love. That he came to justify you and I, cleanse us from our sins, giving us eternal life, a living hope, hope as a person. So church, pray, just pray. I, I want to just give some time to reflect, just a few moments. What areas do you need to make room for God to move in? The implications since Christ laid down his life for us. He also says you ought to lay your lives down for one another. Lord, I pray that you will bring restoration this morning to families, to relationships, to marriages, peers, husbands, fathers, with the arrows of your love even now. I believe that the greatest need in this hour for the church is mothers and fathers rising up and actually living the life that our children can model. Maybe you've been far away from the Lord. Maybe at one time you were following Jesus and you find yourself so far and you're even wondering can I come back beloved while it is called today he says yes like the picture of the father running to you there was a moment when one of my children was not walking with the Lord and I held on to this image in prayer and I saw myself waiting for my prodigal on one arm I had a robe and on the other one I had a ring this is the posture of those that maybe are praying for your children to come back to the Lord and be saved my daughter would sing this one song she would say I see you there at the end of the road open arms, a ring and a robe, and you're running, running towards me. I never lost your mercy. So as a team sings this song, I want to echo this final word. A call for salvation. A call to surrender your life to Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions so that we'd be pierced by his never-ending love. The Lord says to you today, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, those that are burdened, and I will give you rest.